Preston Smiles, my man. P Dazzle. What's up? Bloop, 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 bloop. Welcome, uh, welcome to Men This Way. You're actually a, a repeat guest. You've been here. It's been a couple of years though now, like way back. It has. You were uh, early days. Early, early days. A lot has changed, including Tate, you know, Tate's here. I'm actually really excited. This is the first time you guys are interacting, I think, right? In any meaningful way. I have I have met you a thousand times vicariously through Brian, man, and it is such an honor to finally be in front of you. I, I understand you have some mean axe throwing skills. We're gonna have to put that to the test at some point in time in person. But uh, I hear you're a consummate uh, competitor and just extremely extraordinary. Yeah, guy. That, so, I was about to say not just axe throwing skills. Anything that requires a skill, Preston yeah. is going to at least claim. And be right most of the time that he is <laughs> either masterful in it. or on his way to mastering it. Let I me tell you it. this. I played my first ever real pickleball game and Brian talked a lot of crap. Oh, right? come on, man. Okay, let's go there. Yeah. If we played again right now, <laughs> I would absolutely murder you. <laughs> like, murder. I'm coming for you. When I'm in Austin and next. And uh -huh. learned. Yeah. And you're done. You're done. I'm I'm, 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 I, I challenge accepted. My kind of man, just ready to, for the competition. Challenge accepted. Can't wait for it. Yeah. Well, Preston, man, I'm I'm really excited to have you on. I'm excited for what we're going to talk about today. And you know, to, to really start that off, I just want to honor you first. You know, I, I've been really fortunate to be in uh, uh, an intimate men's group experience with you for what? What's it been like? 2018. I think 17, yep. 18, somewhere around there when we really yep. kicked this off and I think the last four years, especially really since 2019, man, we've been, we've just been, I mean, going deep in all kinds of ways. Right. And so I've gotten to, to really watch you up close, you know, see behind, behind the, the, the veil that a lot of people are going to have to peer through in in the world, just cause that's just the nature of the world. Right. And Man, I just want to celebrate you for th the abundance that you embody, you know, for what you're creating in the world for you've got these four beautiful kids that I've gotten to interact with and, and, you know, chase, chase around and be chased by in your home, right? So much laughter and play and like, you're just crushing life in, in, in the most beautiful ways, man. And I, I tell you it, I, I celebrate that on so many levels so many levels i appreciate that man and i appreciate your friendship i appreciate your elderhood um and by way of tate as well and uh how you two stand even in your friendship right and 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 your friendship to not just me but all the men in the space there are men in our space that are older than you but if if we took a vote and there's no competition but you would be the elder of the room and the group always and i've shared this with you in front of all the guys that whenever you talk i'm always like okay tune in because brian's gonna say something like what's in the forest <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah Everything, Everything in, the forest, in the, forest is the forest is the forest, exactly. And and then I'm gonna have to contemplate it for the next 22 <laughs> years, right? <laughs> and and requests versus requirements in your relationship and all the different things. And outside of all of that, man, um, whenever it gets hot and things start to implode or erode in our space, you are the heart that always brings us back together. And I just want to acknowledge that. Thanks, right man. now. Yep. Thank you. Thank yep. you. I deeply received that. I appreciate yep. that. And from an abundance perspective, yes, I am absolutely beasting in the best way. And uh, it's been uh, trial and error, mainly trial and celebration, because I don't even necessarily believe in error. You know, my wife and I had a really hard time, which you were there for, um, and we're on the brink of divorce. And now, you know, m most people in our community are like, yo, you guys have the best relationship out of everybody. And like, it has completely turned on its head in the best way. And would I like to erase some of the ways in which I jacked our relationship up? Yeah, I ish. I tried to change it a little bit. But like, for the most part, like, if I knew the result was always going to be this, oh, man, 
I'd take it any day of the week. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really present to the fact that if, if we are content and growing in the moment, there is very little of the past that we regret. But if we are in pain in the moment, if the present world is not showing up the way we want it to, then oftentimes we'll look to the past, not realizing that the power is right here, right now. And, you know, look, I've, I've vicariously known you for the last five years, Preston, because the model in many ways, the way in which you, your group of men have connected was the foundation by which we actually helped build a, a year long men's program. And I really get that you brought your men's group together, that you were the one that were, was planting those seeds and wanting to figure out how you could surround yourself with great men and the foundation of abundance uh, that that has rippled out from you. I just, man, I'm just in awe of, and it really is an honor to just connect with you. Deeply appreciate it, man. You know what, what it brings up for me uh, from a philosophical standpoint, I don't believe I can miss. Uh, I don't believe there's a way for me to fail. And so in that, life shows up a little different. Like my, my perspective is that uh, God is like electricity. And electricity never says no. It always says yes. It just has one question, and that is, uh, do you have the capacity for what you're trying to plug up, right? Have you built the infrastructure for what you're trying to connect to? And uh, my biggest work for myself and for my students is building a somatic body that can hold everything I say I want and then some. Because again, God, electricity, always says yes. You can plug up an iPhone, you can plug up a Tesla, you can plug up a, a house, or you can plug up a major city. The biggest issue is the infrastructure. And I think all three of us have built an infrastructure to experience and hold abundance. It's a distinction between lottery winners who can call in abundance in the form of money, but they haven't built a uh, identity and a somatic body that can hold that money. So the money comes and goes uh, in a unhealthy way. While for years and years and years, I've been offering the vibration of celebration and love and harmony and joy and um, forgiveness and just cleaning my own personal body from all the shame and the guilt and the 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 the, the trauma and this the bullying from childhood and all the th ways in which I've been subconsciously even competing up until four, 40 to 40 years old I was competing with my dad and there's a level of freedom that I feel without without that I don't have to hold that monkey anymore and so it's, it's so beautiful to, to be landed in the place that I am now. Um, and I think the, the philosophical piece is, especially over the last 10 years, I've realized that there's no way to miss. Well, you know, one of the, what I'm really excited to keep, explore with you today, Preston, is this idea of abundance and the pursuit of success and particularly to, to, Take on, I don't take on is not the right language, but to confront and and perhaps explore the a, a different paradigm of like so many of us men, we pursue abundance as we equate it with financial, just purely financial. If I have financial abundance, I have abundance, right? And and we also equate uh, the pursuit of success as something I have to grind for. I have to work hard for, I have to work, and not that that's any of that's necessarily wrong in, in and of itself, but but it's incomplete at best. And I'm curious, you know, in your journey, I remember you telling a story, I, mean, I heard this from you years ago about how when you were uh, or early on your journey as an entrepreneur, you were at a, some business workshop and, and, you know, someone was, I think the, the facilitator or the leader was asking you, you know, how are you going to make your money? I, that may not have been the question, <laughs> Do you, but you you, and your answer was like, love. You know that story I'm telling. Can you can you take us into that story and what what happened in that moment? And absolutely. So I'll start with my philosophy is the fruit doesn't belong to the tree, the fruit belongs to the ecosystem. It belongs to the rabbits and the worms and the ground. And and the tree's job is just to say yes and produce and give. 
And so um, early on in my journey, I, funnily enough, I didn't have the money to get into this uh, big speaker conference. And so I just went to the conference and to the lobby and met people and was talking and, and um, you know, networking. And somebody I was talking to said, hey, I'll see you inside. And I said, oh, no, man, I'm not going to make it. And he said, wait, what do you mean? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm not in position right now, but next year I will be here ready to go. He said, give me a second. So he went off and he talked to somebody in the back and they said, you just got a scholarship. You're in. And I said, what? And so now I'm in this big conference and there's this point where this, they say, we're going to do a competition. They, they teach like how to open up a, a talk, right? And we're going to do a competition. We're going to take 10 people and whoever wins is going to win a ticket to this other thing in Houston, Texas, uh, that's even deeper, right? A deeper mastermind. So I raise my hand. I'm one of the only black people in there. They call on me. So there's 10 of us up there and I go up, I do my thing and they vote and I win, right? So that now sends me to this other thing. And, and how crazy this whole story is, is I met a gentleman by the name of Hal Elrod at that one. Now, Hal Elrod was key in me being in Austin and me getting basically a free house on Lake Austin, which is a whole nother story, right? But I drove myself there with no money in my account just to learn from the lobby. And I ended up in and then winning. So now I'm in Houston, Texas. I've, um, I'm staying in people's houses. I'm figuring it out. And there's a point in this workshop where the guy says, all right, you, what's your thing? And I said, man, I believe that love is all there is, was, and ever will be. I've created this thing called the love mob, and I'm here to speak about love. And he said, oh, nah, man, that's not going to work. Nobody will ever buy love. You need to speak on peak performance or leadership. And I was crushed, like <laughs> crushed, yeah. right? Just sat me down on my ass in front of everybody. <laughs> and there was a guy there who was like, hey, I can coach you on that. Just give me 1500 and I'll help you. So now we're back in LA. I sit with this guy and he, I give him $1,500 and he says, you're, uh, for now on, you're going to be America's number one uh, self-esteem coach. I was like, oh, okay. I tried it on. <laughs> I tried it on for maybe. Sexy. Yeah. Maybe yeah. two months. Yeah. And I made a decision after that two months that if I was going to fall, I was going to fall forward. If I was going to fail, I was going to fail on my terms and I was going to do it my way from that point forward. That was one of the biggest, most catalyst decisions I ever made because that from that point forward, fast forward to meeting Alexi, I sold everything, moved in with my mom, used that money to invest in myself and the business. I went from making $36,000 a year in uh, 2012 and 2013 to 150 k most anyone in my family had ever made. 2014, 2015, 300 K, 2016, 600 K, 2017, 1 million. And I literally just kept going. And it was that one decision that was the lead domino for all the other ones. And that is, and I say this all the time, if you make room for your gifts, your gifts will make room for you. And that goes back to the tree, right? Whatever your tree is, if you just produce and give, it'll do what it needs to do. Right? There's a, a divine orchestration always happening, and none of us could control the 12 billion circumstances for the, our lives currently. Like There's a million things right. yeah, that happen totally. every yeah. single day that of course, yeah. are happening beyond us. And so my job is just surrender and say yes to my yes, and I let, I let the universe take the rest. Preston, bring us back to that that tree and what planted those seeds that enabled you to have that mindset, to have that that orientation that, you know, bring us back to because it, it 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 always is either given to us and that it grows or something was withheld from us and there in the gap, something else was made available. So what were the seeds that enabled you to do that? Oh man, this is an interesting thing. So I'm gonna give you guys the cliff notes here, but it's three different stories that are all absolutely nuts. Um, 
I started smoking weed when I was 11. My dad caught me and instead of giving me a whooping and beating me down and putting me on punishment, he said, I'm gonna give you 24 hours to think about everybody's, everybody you know who smokes weed. And you, when you come back, you're gonna tell me whether you want their life or not. Because if you, if you do what they do, you're gonna have what they have. And so I came back 24 hours later and he said, okay, talk to me. What do you wanna do? And I said, well, I don't think I wanna do it. And he said, why? I said, cause I wanna be like Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan and they don't smoke weed, but the boys on the corner do. They said, fantastic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, support you in that. And then he said a thing that changed me forever. He said, I want you to know that you're a leader. And if everybody else is going left, but something inside of you says go right, that you will do it. You're gonna be a boy. You're gonna do dumb stuff, but you're a leader and I believe in you. Now this was 11, genius move, right? My dad did a lot of things wrong. That one, knocked it out of the park. Fast forward, I get a call from my friend, Scott. He says, yo, let's go out, drink, do stupid stuff. Night before that, I said yes. The night before that, I said yes. The night before that, I said yes. But this night, something inside said, don't go. And then my dad's voice popped in. You're a leader. Everybody's going left. Something you says go right. You follow that. I said, no, man, I'm not going tonight. Ah, oh, don't be a right? We go back and forth. I hang up the call. I hang up the phone. Within an hour, every single person in that car that I was in, night before, night before, night before, every one of them was shot. And my best friend, Scott, was shot in the head and died. And so that was, that was the first big moment in my 15-year-old consciousness. I didn't even cry, by the way. I didn't even cry. I didn't know how to process it. Uh, I had survivor's guilt. I had all kinds of stuff. Fast forward. Now this, that was, that was like, okay, something, something's here. Something saved me. And it was a voice in my head. First, it was a feeling. Then the, followed by the voice. Now, fast forward to, um, I'm in LA. I'm doing my thing. I have the love mob. I'm, I'm still broke, but I'm, I'm like pushing forward on this love thing. And I meet two people in a row and then I read something in conversations with God that basically says like, yo, it's time to call in your one. And so I set the intention. I do six months of celibacy to clean my channel, feminine cleanse. And I come out of that and I start dating and I have this moment. One morning, 6 a.m., I wake up out of, out of the blue and I have this feeling, you're going to meet your person. And I'm like, whoa. So I post a picture on Instagram of two wolves kissing. And I say, hashtag wifey, hashtag the queen is on her way. I can feel her coming, right? That's it. I have no clue. That's at 6 a.m. I had a date set up, a blind date for 6 p.m. So 6 p.m., Eva knocks on my door. I open the door. I instantly know it's not her. I'm like, that ain't it. I go upstairs, I ask, am I supposed to go on this date? Resilient, boom, yes. I ask again, I'm like, yo God, for real though, cause this ain't it. <laughs> yeah. Again, yes. So I get dressed, we get in the car, I live in Hancock Park, the show is in um, Venice Beach. Every single red light on Lincoln Boulevard. Skirt, 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 we're already late. Every red light. And there's this point where I start to think, okay, I just did a video on all the people who missed their flights during 9-11. I just was talking about the person who called in sick, who was in the Twin Towers, who wasn't there. Let me just calm myself and ride this wave. Long story short, we get there. They say, we oversold the show by 10 seats. You're gonna have to stand on the wall. Um, I look at my date, I'm like, ah, oh. they say, we can give you your money back or you can come tomorrow. I look at her, she says, let's go in, right? I allow myself to be influenced. We go in, the guy sits us on the wall. 
He takes a couple steps. It's almost as if he's shot by lightning. He stops, turns back around. Now, there's already 20 people on the wall. But he chooses us, and he says, you two, actually, come here. He puts two more chairs down on the emergency row in the front row. He sits my chair here, sits my date right here. I look at the stage. I look at my date. Right next to her is Alexi. And I instantly knew it was my wife. Like, instantly. Mm -hmm. You, you, you know, uh, both Tate and I have likewise these magic stories of meeting our partners. In fact, I mean, Tate, you know, Preston, you certainly know, know, know mine. Uh, you know, I had to, I had to go thousands of miles away to meet the woman who lived 20 miles away from me kind of thing. Um, let's, well, I want to pull apart some of the principles and the things that you're pointing to in your stories, right? Some of the, you know, I'm thinking of a lot of our listeners, like this is going to be new to a lot of people. You know, the, the, the story that you're living, that your life is the, the, one of the things I also want to just speak into this conversation. And I've shared this with a lot of people and I've told you, Preston, to your face, you are one of the most generous people that I know. Right. I mean, generous of spirit, generous just of giving, generous of whether both, both, yes, financially, but just like just you wanting to share whatever it is that you have, you want to share it with people, man. And I, again, that's, I celebrate that about you. And, and it's such a beautiful thing. And it's, I know it's connected to your experience of abundance, to all of the things, the doors that have opened for you in your life. There's, th those aren't exclusive, those go together. So, but let's pull apart some of the principles because I'm thinking of the men that are listening. A lot of, we have a lot of female listeners as well. And, but I, I think, you know, when we talk about these kinds of things, there can be this gap opens up a, a gap of skepticism, a gap of, well, you know, you're just lucky or you're, there's just a, I don't know that what, what, what Preston is able to do with that, that just exists in a realm that I don't, can't relate to, you, you know, that, that, that voice of, our culture, our society. So let's pull apart some of the the principles that you are embodying, that you're living, that you're a stand for in, in practical ways that some of our listeners uh, might be able to better connect to. Absolutely. Uh, I'll start with this because people ask this often, uh, people who don't go to our workshops and stuff like that, or they hear something on a podcast and they say, okay, well, if I live on the other side of the planet, where do I start? How do I do this if I can't get into the same room with you and Alexi? And uh, I'll go through some of the things that anybody could start doing right now because uh, my philosophy and belief and understanding is the body is a living library that stores everything we've ever been through. And most humans have a whole bunch of unprocessed trauma and shame and uh, just gook still stuck in their bodies. And we are threefold beings, body, mind, and soul. And oftentimes we try to control life with our minds, but we forget that the soul is there and that the body has a say-so too. When all three of those are aligned, we're at our most powerful. And so what I'm about to speak to is about aligning all three, but especially the body. You free the body, you free everything else. Again, my work is about this particular thing because I believe that mindset work by itself is incomplete. Um, and so number one, make a list of all the people you still haven't forgiven and spend some time finding some inch, even an inch, 1% more forgiveness, 1% more compassion, 1% more empathy, 1% more understanding. That's one. Number two, the universe and our bodies don't speak English. God doesn't speak English. Our bodies don't speak English. What they speak is frequency and vibration. And so what I have my clients do is uh, set three to five alarms in their phone. They're called joy alarms. Every time the alarm goes off, you burst into spontaneous joy. The reason for this is twofold. One, it feels good. Two, it sends signals from the brain to the body that there's something to celebrate. We know scientifically that everything is vibration. 
We understand biologically that if we put a microscope over Tate or Brian or me, if you break, break me down and break me down and break me, break me down, there'll be no thing there. Everything is vibration in the space. And so everything has a frequency, but the frequency doesn't speak English. So the work is to fill your own cup, then give from the overflow. How do you fill your cup? You tap into the baseline of what it means to be human. We've been socially and historically programmed. Now watch this. I'm going back to the practical. Socially and historically programmed into beliefs and interpretations. The reason I didn't cry when my friend was shot in the head is because I took on the social and historical programming that big boys don't cry. Not to be a little pussy. That your job as a boy at 15 is to never show emotion, especially sadness. Well, well, Preston, I'm also present to, we also, you were not allowed to show much exuberant joy either. That, I mean, that's what girls do. You know, keep your cool. So the work is to make another list of all the things that you inherited. Not, not, not who you are, but who you became. Because as kids, you guys know this, we, uh, we adapt. My, my parents, super stressed out, I became an out-of-the-way kid, right? I'll have no needs. Somebody else's parents, depressed, they become a cheerer-upper kid. I'll crack jokes. I'll make everybody happy. Somebody else's family structure, dangerous. I'll become quiet. No one will ever know I'm there. We all adapt. And so who you know yourself as is an amalgamation. It's a safety strategy. So the game is to go back to that and go, okay, what did I get from my dad, his dad, and his dad about money, about women, about uh, spirituality? What did, what did I inherit from church that I don't want to keep? What did I inherit from the school system that no longer fits where I'm going? All of these strategies worked to keep us safe. The question is, is do we still need them? And for most men and women, if you really take a look, you go, oh, I don't know if I need that anymore. I don't know if that's serving me anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking also of, you know, Tate and I, we have this, this ritual that we do every time a, a new man comes into one of our programs. Uh, Tate will FaceTime me, we'll get on FaceTime and we'll do a little dance. But I'm, I'm going to own something here. We, we have lost some enthusiasm in doing that <laughs> dance. <laughs> right? We, we, you know, Tate, I, that f call comes up and Tate doesn't FaceTime me except for when that happens. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to have to fucking, because we want to celebrate. Well, I mean, if we can't celebrate the, the very thing that we're, we're up to, which is serving men in this way. And when a man says yes and comes in, if we can't celebrate that moment, what the fuck are we doing this for? Right. <laughs> and still though, there is a, there's a story, there's a momentum that we're running a marathon, not a sprint here. Right. And it's a long slog and it's a lot of work and, and it's, you know, and again, the somatic body, by which I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I can be grumpy. Um, I don't always, I don't think I get enough sleep anymore. You know, it's like just the, the aches of a 50 year old, all, the, all these things. And Tate, then, you know, it's like, we're going to dance. There's that part of me is like, fuck that. I don't want to dance. Okay. I'll bob my head and do this thing. And, you know, and, but that's, and I, that's not okay. By which I just mean that that I do not want to live my life that way, right? It's not fun. Of you know, the idea of even playing as an adult is so hard to come by. You know, I I don't have kids right now. God willing, life will make that happen. But I know children bring play into ad adult lives, and my wife and I don't have the blessing of that right now. And so, anyway, just. <clears throat> Let's talk about the somatic body piece, because I think, again, there's such a, a resistance, particularly in male bodies. But I know women struggle with this, too. Like you, you, you talk about those joy alarms. What, what comes up for me immediately is like, I don't want to fucking feel joy five times a day. Well, why not? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I do. But again, there's a somatic resistance almost. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, absolutely. So, so, so let's stay in this 
for a little bit and talk about that. First off, what do you mean by somatic body? Yes. Right? Somatic well, let's start there. Means the wisdom of the body. The body has its own wisdom, right? We have three centers of intelligence, the head, the heart, and the gut. And most people try to figure everything out with the head. And we don't even really get that there is science behind the heart and the coherence. There's a, 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 a vibrational field that our heart em, uh, emits. And we've been so dulled down through porn and all the other weapons of mass distraction that we forget that life is to be actually genuinely lived. Right? I have friends who have way more money than me, but I'm writing a book called Spiritual Millionaire because I actually am, not just in money, but in consciousness, right? I genuinely, I know when I walk out this door, there's a, a lizard named Leroy, there's the butterflies, there's the whole crew, right? I know the trees on this property. I, I, I allow life to fully take, hit me and be moved by it. I'm moved by my kids, I'm moved by you guys, I'm moved by all of life, and that just, one, feels better, two, there's a distinction between what is normal and what is natural. And we have gotten caught up in the virus of the mind of what is um, normal. In normal everyday society, we're grumpy and we're gross and we're that and we're achy and we're this. And I'll give you an example. Deepak Chopra talks about this in one of his books a thousand years ago about how they did a study of people in the psych wards. The people who were crazy, I'm using air quotes here, enough to not know time, aged differently than the people who were crazy but understood their age. So the 64-year-olds the who were kind of still regular people aged to 64. But the 64-year-olds who were so out of their mind, meaning outside of what has become normal, they naturally aged differently. And so all of my work is about reclaiming the marketing machine that has told me what I need to be and what I need not to be. I am in a, a unique emanation of the Most High. And whatever we call that thing, Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, Allah, source, divine intelligence, it just wants to say yes. Right? All materials on the planet want to be expressed and experienced. That white shirt, that blue shirt, this uh, seafoam green shirt, all of them, all three of our shirts want it to be ours. How do we know? Because it is. How do we know? Because that we, we, we had a, a divine date with destiny. And we didn't, we didn't um, make it bigger than it needed to be. And that's the same for all material, period. All materials. My car, your car, the house you live in, this house, they built it in 2005. They didn't know that they were building it for me too. But I will steward it. I will use it and I will allow it to circulate. Now this goes back to the somatic body question. Everything needs to circulate. The more spaciousness we have in the body, the more circulation, the more receptivity, the more available space, like real estate, location, location, location. The more space I have, the more space I have to build a skyscraper, a mansion, a compound in my consciousness. Now I can hold my wife. I can hold my kids differently. I can hold money differently. I can hold all the materials of this world differently because I have the spaciousness. So in short, to me, our job, especially as men, is to heal slash relinquish slash let go of the trauma and the shame and the guilt that we've been carrying for years and years and years that's stuck in the body. You know, I, I really, I mean, one of the things that you're speaking to is so profound because I, one of the, the, the two parts that you've spoken to that really hit me the most are the the lack of forgiveness that we have a tendency to give to the external world and then that is also the shame that we carry which is the lack of forgiveness that we have to ourselves. and the, the way i love the way that has been framed to me in the past is that these that, that lack of forgiveness and resentment those are the things that block us from the sunlight of the spirit 
Mm. Right. Yes. And so and so what I love about this is that if if men are listening to this, women are listening to this and they want more abundance in their life, that one of the pathways to that is first we must let go of that which is holding us back from the connections that matter most to ourself, the shame, which is that that part of ourselves that we are are demonizing. Brian knows that I have this part inside of me called Sammy the Shamer. It's that it's that guy that's inside of me that tells me to do all the things that then tells me I'm a fuck up for listening to him to do do in the begin the first place. And then the second part of uh, which is like that part of me, which wants to believe that I'm better than the person that has done harm to me. And so if we want more abundance, how do we let go of that judgment of ourselves and the lack of forgiveness that we have of others? And there really is abundance then doesn't become like the secret which is you have to know the the perfect frequency to be able to find the gap in the world that's going to open up. No, it's actually really practical. In what ways can you forgive yourself and let go of the, the, the things that have been handed to you? And in what ways can you let go of the pain that somebody else has harmed you, knowing that they have made mistakes? You don't have to keep them in your life. But if you want to move forward, you've got to let go of that pain. Bro, absolutely, yes. My belief is that we are living and swimming in abundance. It's like a fish that doesn't know it's in water. And it's, it's literally elevation requires separation. So it's, it's addition by subtraction, right? Like I gain abundance by subtracting all the stuff that has me believing it's not already here, right? It, it's, it's me paying attention to like what's really happening. Oh my God, the butterflies are here. The dragonflies are here. The air. I never have to look for another breath because the air is always here. When I open my eyes, I actually have eyes to open. Right? When I wake up, it's in a house, on a bed. When I need water, I get to go and get some. Like winning.com. And what you appreciate appreciates and what you focus on expands. So the whole game is, hey, What's blocking me from seeing the beauty and the magic that is here now? Not when I get the promotion, not when my wife approves of me, not when my kids get A's, not any of that. Right here, right now is beautiful. If you actually are looking with the eye behind the eye, if you are open, if you're available to see it, it's here now. And that's literally, people see it all the time. I'm like, yo, I love my life because I'm looking for it. I'm looking for the beauty all the time. Yeah, there's this, there's this, uh, uh, we use in relationship conversations, something called the Cartman Triangle, which talks about how is drama created in your world. And, and one of the, one of the seats that somebody can always sit inside of to be in drama is to be the victim. And the way to step out of being the victim is to actually realize that we're the creator. And one of the things that you're really speaking to is, is the skill of activating, right? So can you actually speak to most of us are, are in the midst of a, of a busy life. We are inundated with distraction. We are, we are grinding and, and, and struggling. So how do we develop that skill of activating parts of ourselves which are dormant that are that are numbed that are not as alive the, the the dance that brian and i have to how do we begin to activate more intentionally the things that we need to be activating uh so i explain it like this often um if we were all you know in the middle of the sahara desert and we had an eaten for days and days and days and we hadn't drank water for days and days and days and we found a tree with mangoes on it and we could see as we got closer to the tree that the, there was these juicy big mangoes at the top of the tree but at the bottom of the tree were a little smaller a little more beat up mangoes we had two choices one we climb right past the ones that are easy to get to try to get to the top that has danger to it or two we eat what's right here enjoy what's right here let it strengthen us let it bring more vitality to us and from that place we leap onto that tree and go higher so to me one of the best things anybody could do is just find deep gratitude 
for exactly where you are. What, what is right on your tree right here, right now? What can you celebrate in this moment? How can you see your, your I say this all the time, um, the moment I think I know my wife, our relationship is over. Because I, I no longer, she, she no longer can be anything other than what I think I know of her. And so I'm constantly taking myself out of the knowing position and rediscovering her. How can I rediscover her today? How can I eat the mangoes that are right here? How can I love my kids? How can I love hide and seek? How can I love this moment where I'm in the middle of the night and th th one of them peed in the bed, the other one's having nightmares and the other one's ran down the hallway from, from uh, you know, <laughs> thinking that the dog's attacking them, right? It's like, how can I expand in this space right here? Not when we have the perfect nanny or the perfect kids and no one's peeing in the bed, but like, can I love this moment too? Like that, to me, that's, that's one of the mo most beautiful openings. Yeah. Um, Cause life it's activating, but Tate, it's also savoring. I do a really good job at savoring moment by moment because there will be a day, right? Is it annoying to tie my kid's shoes every day? Sometimes, but there will be a day where they won't let me tie those shoes. And so while I got it, I'm going to savor it, right? Do I, do I want to change a thousand diapers a day and ha get poop on my thumbs? Not necessarily, but there'll be a moment where I, I, I think, oh man, I used to hold your little booty and kiss you and tickle you and like, look at you now, right? So savoring. You know, I, uh, the, the book, The Surrender Experiment, Michael Singer, you know, his work, Untethered Soul, that's such a rich dive into 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 living in partnership. I, the way I like the language is living in partnership with life, right? Being in partnership with life, power with, not for power over. And but one of the one of the key teachings, key lessons from those books for me was very simple. And you're speaking to it right now, Preston. It's like in any given moment, we're either opening or closing. That's it. In any given moment. I'm either opening to what is, opening to life, opening in my, in my, I mean, and literally viscerally in my body, or I'm closing, I'm contracting, I'm tightening down, I'm breathing less, I'm, I'm, you know, getting ready for the fight or the grind or whatever it is to climb this fucking hill. I got to climb every damn day, uh, pushing the, what's, what's that, uh, this is this, this, this. yeah, pushing the boulder up to only to have it fall back down and put right, uh, contracting. And I find, you know, we work with a lot of men. We see a lot of people that have created a form of abundance in terms of typically material things, but they're not enjoying it. No. Right? No. They're, 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 there's a closure. Let me tell you what it is. Um, there's only two games ever happening. Outside in game or the inside out game. The outside in game says that, you know, what's in my bank account, how my wife is treating me, how, how the weather is, dictates how I feel about me. If I have the right followers, if my podcast is blowing up, then I feel good, right? To me, no matter how high you get, I just got another client, a 50K client yesterday, one-on-one. -on -one. This person easily has more money than me, and this person knows that I have a better life because we all have become sophisticated addicts, right? We walk, we walk downtown and we go, oh, look at these meth addicts. Oh, I feel so bad for them. Bro, that Ferrari will not make your dick bigger. It won't make you love harder, right? There's nothing you can do. You can't, I don't care how many bags you get, how many flights you take. It's an illusion. And anybody who's big enough to see it will see it. We can see right through it. And whether we see it or not, People know, I know, I know how it felt for me to be that way. And I also know and have tasted the freedom to go, I'll still play with all the materials, but the materials won't be my God, right? There's a book called Healing the Shame That Binds You. And he talks about how the, 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 the fuck up, right? The person who messes up life and, and the overachiever have a similar toxic shame living under how they approach life, right? The, the, the screw up just says, screw it. I'll, I'll, I'll go smoke some crack. I'll go do this. I'll go, you know, prostitutes, X, Y, and Z. Who cares, right? Because ultimately I'm a piece of shit. 
the, the overachiever says, I'll make a bunch of money and I'll, I'll keep achieving so that you guys never see how I really feel about myself. And to me, if we, if we went down any street right now and lined up 100 men, I'd say 90 of them are playing that game. And, 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 and say more about that. Why, Preston? Why are 90 men playing that game and only 10 aren't? And how do we move the 90 to the 10? Exactly. It goes back to social and historical programming. You can't be what you, what you, what you haven't seen. And so we got Homer Simpson, we got Hulk Hogan, we got Clint Eastwood, we got Ninja Turtles, we got Santa Claus, we got all these different caricatures of what a man is. And then we, we now have social media, right? And, and yet we haven't been able to up until this point. Actually, we have. It just, it's growing to see men like you and Brian, to see men like myself who can stand in integrity, stand in, in power, and and be dope and interesting and love your family and like have a life that you actually genuinely love it's it makes so much sense that the porn industry is as big as it is it makes so much sense because there's a whole bunch of now this is going to get controversial people are going to hate me for what i'm about to say but i'm, I'm gonna say it anyway i believe that a whole bunch of well-meaning mothers well-meaning mothers and checked out dads but well-meaning mothers did their best to beat out the parts of the masculine that wounded them. And so what that created was a bunch of little sneaky chameleon boys who did everything that mommy thinks is good, but they can't beat their biology. And so their dicks still come online. And instead of having a dad who is in his power, and in his game, they get another version of what we all already got. And so we go look for it online and we find porn and we find all of this stuff. And there's a whole bunch of men, the, the, the sex trafficking industry, all of it to me is a reflection of fathers not being in the house. When stuff goes down in my house, you know what they say? I'm getting your dad. I'm getting your dad. And you know what happens? No matter how crazy it gets, I put them on my chest. And I say, hey, that's not going to work in this house. And daddy loves you. I love you enough to hold you right here because you're now being a danger. I take him outside in the woods in the middle of the night. Okay, buddy, you want to do this? Let's go. We're going to sit here together. I'm not leaving you, but it's not going to work. That's the stuff that most people don't get, never got. It's what men, uh, women are craving they're craving it. They want to put their masculine down too. So to me, the work that you guys are doing is the solution to that. We're just breathing, breathing it in. We have a, an epidemic in this world of men not having trustable men in their lives. Right? That, that we've had fathers to varying degrees be absent physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually absent. And, and one of the things that Brian and I have a regular conversation about is that there are a whole lot of olders and not enough elders. He, he actually quotes you often uh, and, and references, it's not the weight of the load that a man's carrying that will break him, but how he's carrying it. That part. So tell us how to carry it how to carry the, 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 what, what you have just said is absolutely right. That we are checked out in a thousand ways that we are using porn and work and shopping and fantasy football and every other thing, right? It's, it's not just porn. It's a, a, a hundred things. So what is the pathway for men to start carrying the, the weight that he's carrying and be stepping into the spiritual abundance that is that they are breathing in but can't see that okay so i'm gonna do one that's like light and fluffy and awesome and one that's a little heavier um the heavier one i'll start with that first all humans have shame and guilt that we carry there's something you did and i'm talking to the men on who are listening to this podcast right now there's something you did whether it was when you were 10, 13, 
19, something you did in college, something you're not proud of, a secret you have right now, something you haven't shared with your wife, you barely have any friends, so you haven't shared it with any of them, and something you keep close to your chest. In our work, uh, the Bridge Experience, we talk about how um, what imprisons us also points to our freedom. So the very thing that you've been hiding and holding close to your chest. Side note, in that workshop, we ask people to share some of their deepest, darkest secrets. And we always start by saying, we've done this all over the world for 10 years. And for 10 years, the overwhelming majority of the room has been sexually assaulted, molested, abused in some form or fashion, men included. So we preface that. And then over and over and over again. Self-included. So, short answer, find one person and share that secret. Release yourself from the... Because shame wants to hide. When you shine a flashlight on the shame, when you shine a flashlight on the guilt, you know, there's things. When the Me Too movement happened, I was like, oh man, there's a few things I did in college that were way out of pocket. If those things happened to my daughter, I would be livid. And I did it. And I reached out to all of those women, Tate and Brian. I reached out to all of them. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry what I did. That was terrible. So that's the, that's that side. Well, and, and before you go to the next, you know, what, what, I, as I just think about my own journey and, and clearing shame, I mean, think coming back to that distinction, you're either opening or closing in any given moment. Well, when I'm carrying shame, all I can, and I don't want it to be seen or witnessed. I want to hide it. Well, I had the only way to do that is to contract is to close to, to, con, to congeal around it and then just live in that body. Again, we're talking about like, if, if, if it takes physical shape. I mean, you know, how many men can't really smile with their faces, you know, can't really, when I was in the military, I, I didn't know this until looking back after I took mushrooms and that unleashed something in me. And then I did, again, did a lot of shame work. Like I didn't really know how to laugh. You know, I definitely couldn't cry, but I sure as shit couldn't laugh either. And guess what? Most men also, because I didn't make love to a woman until my wife. You know why? Because I never was in my heart. How can I make love to a woman if I don't have access to my heart? Yeah. So it's all, it all, it touches everything. That shame, that secret. And, and guess what, guys? I have released and spoken about like a hundred things. So I know you got one. Right? <laughs> I know you got one. I got a hundred yeah. <laughs> that I will unload. Right? So find, find someone safe. Share the shame. Share the guilt. Hey, this is something I've been holding. I just want a friend, just anybody to just, somebody safe, to hold this with me. Right? So that instantly dissipates the part of you that feels like you're a piece of shit. You're not. You're not. You're normal. Right? Um, the other side is play more. The happier and the more creative and the more in your, uh, it, when you create a culture of play, A, just for yourself, let alone for your, your partner, let alone for your kids. When you create a culture of play, like my kids are building forts right now in our living room, right? I chase them around, tickle them, throwing them every day. Not, I don't miss a day. I put them to bed every single night. I play. I play with my wife. I smack her ass. I, I throw her on the bed. I go wake surfing. I do stuff that fills my cup because when daddy's cup is full, I do fight club, right? Mixed martial arts. Because when my cup is full and I'm doing stuff that feels good for me, I bring that back to my children, that to my workspace, that to my wife, that to my community. So clear the shame, share it with somebody, culture of play. Oh, and that, that and that's the hard that's the harder one for me. That, totally. As a matter I can, of fact, we we import our play every year to our retreat <laughs> <laughs> because there's a guy that yeah. has the greatest joy and he can bring spontaneity and uh, we import it because Brian and I suffer trying to have I, it. I can reveal shame all day long. I've been practicing yeah. that for years. Yeah. I you know, and that's a superpower of mine. You can't you can't get me 
because I'm I'm already gotten. I got myself. Yeah. 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 I've already I've already confessed. You can't out me. <clears throat> but um, but play, yeah. That that's that's the edge for me. Um, and it's it's counterintuitive. Preston, where be, because we're always expanding. Where is your edge these days? What what are where is your edge of spiritual abundance that you're just still leaning into right now? Yes. Oh man, there's there's so many. I think the one that's most potent for me right now is continuously again, this is going to sound controversial. I'll, I may write a book on this, but I I made this discovery with my wife after a lot of hard times where I stopped listening to her. And the moment I stopped listening to my wife and attuning to her body, our whole family changed. The kids changed. Everybody transformed. And so my biggest work is to continuously to be attuning to her nervous system and offering my masculine pole to her without getting caught up in the details of what she's saying and allowing myself to be the sky and her to be the storms and the summer rains and all the other stuff that happens in our space. My biggest work right now, because when, when the house is good, when mommy is taken care of, I used to hate, people said this on my wedding day. They said, happy wife, happy life. And I said, bullshit. <laughs> why, does she, why does she get to be happy over me? I was mad. I was like, nope, right? Now I get it from a spiritual perspective, right? Out of 8 billion people, I get an opportunity to help her heal her nervous system, right? I get it from the perspective of my kids are the greatest gifts I've ever been given. And she endured a period since 13 years old to, to, to bring my kids through the, to, to her body. Like the least I could do if, if she's been doing it since 13 is to hold those hormones, hold the beauty of her feminine storm and her creativity in such a way that, that she feels safe to be a woman. That. And, 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 and I would just want to clarify too, just to, because to, if a, a man takes that on face value to not listen to my wife, that's the secret to a healthy relationship. <laughs> let's, let, let's just get into the little bit of the subtext, right? Because I know, I know what you're pointing at. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, I don't listen to the to the to the content. I listen to the context, right? So said differently, my wife will come to me and she'll say something like this. Um, and this is old stuff. I'll go really old school. She'll yeah, say, yeah, yeah. "I feel like you spend more time in your phone than you do with the kids, and I just don't understand like what it is about us that you don't love." Right? <laughs> Now, if I listen to right, the yeah. words that she said there, yeah. uh, we're fighting. We are we're fighting. fighting right? Scorched earth. Time to, to I'm like, Here we go. No, Let's you go. pick up your phone too. You do this. <laughs> why? Like we're going at it if I listen to those words, right? If I attune to her body and to the need that's under that top layer conversation, we have a whole different world we're operating from. And so I, something like that will come and I'll say, oh, baby, thank you for sharing. Um, can I just start by hugging you? I love you so much. I, I'm not even, I won't take it in. I literally won't even let it land because she's dysregulated. And if I'm dysregulated, we're both dysregulated, and we're she, fighting. And, and she's just making, and look, no disrespect. She's just making shit up anyway. Just telling a story based on a limited view of things and a, and a, and a pain and, a, and a, a hurt that she's in. Translating in his story, it's your fault. You you need to do something different in order to rescue me. And I say, if I hook into that with, oh, I'm I'm done, done for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there may be some truth to what she's saying, but the delivery method, right? I know my nervous system enough that if the, that dart gets in there and yeah. it's a poison dart, and I roll <laughs> with the dart, we yeah. it's a knife fight, right? Like, okay, you ain't cool. the only one, yeah, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> I'll listen later. I'll listen once we're regulated. I'll listen once where we've got the need. What's the thing under it? Oh, you feel lonely. Oh, you feel scared. Oh, you saw I liked somebody's comment or a picture and, and you made up a whole story about me leaving the family or X, Y, and Z. Whatever it is, I'm making this up right now. But the point is, is like regulation comes first. And to me, my job is to be uh, in my body in such a way that I can hold her while she's holding her and the kids and the details of the house. So relevant and rich for 
me and every guy that I know, right? I mean, just this is the way to lean in. It, 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 wrapping this up, is there any last question that we really want to land or? Man, I got a thousand for you, Preston, yeah. but I'm yeah. not more yeah. than any other question, man. I just, I want to start, I want to end the way that Brian started, which is just celebrating you as a guy in the world who is making a fucking difference, who is leaning in with his heart wide open, with his head up, held up high, mind open, just leaning into everything that's that's not only coming your way, but being a gift in the world to other people who need the message that you're given. I, I saw that you 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 know you're in the midst of of launching this book. But you had three things that you said that just hit me square between the eyes each time, which is that finding a way to turn our mess into our message, our pain into our purpose, and our fate, our fear into faith. Like you're clearly a man that's trying to, to give the breadcrumbs for men to find their way in the passage between the, those two worlds where we can just get forever stuck or find forever freedom. So, man, just celebrating you, brother, truly. Appreciate you guys deeply. Yeah. Um, and anybody out there who wants to pre-order that book, it's PrestonSmiles.com forward slash book. It's called Spiritual Millionaire, Unlock the Seven Inner Laws of Abundance and Money. Yes, uh, that'll all be in the show notes. Preston, I love you so much, man. So grateful for you. Thank you for coming on to Men This Way, and uh, we'll do it again in the future. What for an sure. honor, man. Love y'all.